Hey, this is Leach with Simpson Math, and today we're talking about irrational and imaginary roots in context of graphing polynomials. Now, before we do, let's make sure we're all on the same page about irrational numbers and imaginary numbers. Now, irrational numbers, they are the subset of the real number set where numbers cannot be written as a ratio. Now, a ratio is just basically a fraction. So quite simply, irrational numbers are all the numbers that are real that can't be written as a fraction. We use this symbol, this double bar I, to represent the, the irrational number set. And examples, some popular examples are pi, um, E, we'll talk about E in a few lectures, and then square root of 2, and actually, for that matter, any radical that doesn't simplify, like cube root of 7, that doesn't simplify, that's irrational. So notably, integers, so these numbers, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2, on and on forever in both directions, um, they are not irrational numbers. Rational numbers, um, numbers that can be written as fractions, which also include integers, those are not irrational. Um, and shortcuts for those are the this double bar Z and the double bar Q are those uh, the shortcuts for those uh, number sets. So irrational numbers are all those numbers that cannot be written as a fraction. And notably today, we'll be looking at our square roots that don't simplify. Next, we can talk about imaginary numbers. The square root of negative 1, which is I, that is the imaginary number. So if someone re references the imaginary number, it is this. But all imaginary numbers are all those numbers that basically sort of kind of have this stuck on it. So examples would be like 3i or negative 7 halves i or square root of 2i. So we get this i because mathematicians, we needed a way to define square rooting a negative. I know that if I, um, I'm thinking of square rooting a negative number, um, I need a, that means I need to find a number that when I multiply by itself, I get a negative. Well, a positive times a positive is positive, not negative. A negative times itself, which is another negative, is also positive. So I needed something that when I multiply by itself, I get uh, a negative. So that means that if I take i and I multiply it by itself, we get negative 1. So that's why these things are considered my imaginary numbers. Collectively, um, they form a part, the other part of our complex number systems, where, uh, which is a plus bi. The a is the real part, and the bi is the imaginary part, where a and b are just real numbers. So uh, we have complex numbers uh, with a real part and imaginary part. Um, today's lectures, we'll be seeing there are times when we'll get imaginary numbers, and sometimes it might be complex numbers. Collectively, we'll, we will just refer to um, as any numbers when there is an imaginary part that's not just zero as a non-real um, or an imaginary number. All right, we're going to take a look at two super quick examples just to make sure that we're clear about what's irrational and what's imaginary uh, and how they interact with us finding these roots. So let's take a look at f of x being x squared minus 3. So before we begin, we need to uh, think about all of our, our in behavior, um, our x-intercepts, y-intercepts, our roots, number of roots, number of turns, all those things. So um, we have our uh, leading term test tells us that we're going to be rising to the right because our leading coefficient is positive, and we're going to then have same in behavior and rise to the left because we have an even degree. Next, um, we know that because we have this uh, even degree, this degree of 2, uh, that we should, should just have one turn. We ex uh, have two roots, and we expect two of those to be x-intercepts. We have a y-intercept at 0, comma, negative 3. Uh, because if I plug in a 0, I'm just left with this negative 3. So 0, negative 3. Now all I need to finish graphing this is my x-intercepts. So let's set the function to be equal to 0. So I'm going to say f of x is 0 and not solve. And we'll be able to solve by adding a 3 to both sides. And we end up with 3 equals x squared. Now, I need to get the square to go away. And we can accomplish this by square rooting both sides. And as always, whenever we are the creator of a square root, we have to include the plus or minus. So my two roots are a, plus or mi a positive square root of 3 and a negative square root of 3. So that means that we have two x-intercepts.
we have an x-intercept at negative square root of 3, comma, 0, and another x-intercept at square root of 3, comma, 0. So remember, we write our x-intercepts as these ordered pairs. So just to clarify, we have two irrational roots. They're irrational because square root of 3 cannot be written as a fraction. Um, for that matter, it, it's not a decimal that terminates, because if it's a decimal that terminates, ends, or repeats, um, then it could be written as a fraction. If we were to use a calculator, we could square root 3 and get approximately 1.73. But I could also just approximate it as understanding that it's a little bit less than 2. Um, if I square root 4, I get exactly 2. So if I square root 3, it should be, it should be just a little bit less than 2. So let's sketch my graph. Now, because this is an uh, x squared minus 3, it's in a uh, transformation form, actually. This minus 3 just tells me to shift this parent function down 3. So in this particular graph, I don't really need to go through all this mess. Um, but your uh, upcoming, uh, some upcoming examples that we're going to have, uh, and likely which you'll see in your homework, uh, you cannot just graph using your knowledge of transformations. You'll have to use, uh, use this new approach. We have our y-intercept at 0, negative 3. And we have our two x-intercepts uh, at negative square root of 3, comma, 0, and square root of 3, comma, 0. Like I said, that it's a little bit less than 2. So I can go over a little bit less than 2 to get that square root of 3. Additionally, you can graph uh, a few more points on the parabolas. Um, because this, what, like I said, this was a uh, transformation graph, so I was able to plot a few more points just to make it be nice, or you could have just uh, plotted a few of them by plugging in some x values. Since this is a uh, parabola, I'm wanting a few more things. My x is a symmetry is x equals 0. We know that it's x equals 0, 1 from the graph. And secondly, if I try to plug in the b, which is a big fat 0 right now, into the opposite b over 2a, I end up with just x equals 0, so that's my axis of symmetry, x equals 0. If I plug this 0 in to my equation, I'll, in, I'll end up with the negative 3, which is the same thing as my y-intercept. And then we have our domain in range as well, uh, overall numbers for my domain, and from negative 3 to infinity for my range. So this quick example showcased our irrational roots, so let's take a look at g of x. g of x is x squared plus 3. Let's do the same business about in behavior, and it has the same stuff. It rises to the right because we have a positive uh, leading coefficient, and it will have the same in behavior and also rise to the left because it's an even degree uh, polynomial. We have our one turn that we're expecting, but this time our y-intercept is at a 0, positive 3, but we have two roots and we expect two x-intercepts because of that 2. So let's solve. Let's set the function to be equal to 0, and then solve. To do that, I'm going to subtract a 3 from both sides. So this time, this is a negative 3. And now I need to square root both sides, um, include my plus or minus. But notice, we have our square root of negative 3. That's square rooting a negative. So how do I deal with this? Well, just to be clear, let's rewrite negative 3 as a negative 1 times 3. So this is... Um, negative 1 times 3, and I can break this apart into square root of negative 1 times square root of 3. And we talked about just a second ago that the square root of negative 1 is this thing called i, which is the imaginary number. So I can simplify plus or minus the square root of negative 3 into plus or minus i square root of 3. All right, so what does that tell me about my roots? Well, um, we have no actual x-intercepts, and that means that we have two imaginary or non-real roots. These two imaginary or non-real roots uh, are a negative i square root of 3 and a positive i square root of 3. All right, so when, when we come to graphing this, again, I don't have an x-intercept. This graph does not cross the x-axis anywhere. We do have two roots. If I take this negative i square root of 3 and plug it into that x and simplify, I will end up with 0. I will end up with a true statement. Uh, I'll end up with showing that this is a root because it makes the function be 0. Same thing with i square root of 3. Now, I can graph this because I know that this is a, I know my end behavior. It's rising to the right and rising to the left. And I have my x, my, sorry, my y-intercept at 0, 3. 
So with that knowledge, I could then at least just form some form of a parabola. But since I know, again, that this uh, is a parabola uh, with an A of 1, I can then just graph it from this vertex, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, so forth, um, or plug in a few additional points if I want to. All right, and again, my last little bits, uh, my axis symmetry is also 0, x equals 0, rather. My vertex is 0, 3. I got a few additional points from the parent function, and I have my domain and range, this time going from 3 all the way up to infinity. So this is the gist about this new lecture. We have irrational roots, as we saw in f of x, and we have imaginary roots, as we saw in g of x. The next examples will be a little bit more algebra intensive, and not just uh, two parabolas that have been shifted up or down. Um, so join me in the next video when we take a look at two more examples that are going to be a little bit more in depth.